Oh, look at them. There they are, the quarks. How much? <gasps> I, I thought you meant my ginger nuts. I was like, oh, hello. Hello, and welcome to another book about who. This week we are on part one of three for season six. Six. Part one of three of season six. I'm Paul or Peabow, and joining me today are. Hello, this is James and the Quarks. And hey, this is Jason, and I don't believe we've got finally to the story that's got the quarks in it. We're not in the five doctors, are we? Oh. <laughs> I had to double check. You didn't have to watch it twice. No. <laughs> well, anyway, so, so, so we kick off season six with the Dominators. So... Who wants to start us off on? Oh, look at this lovely hardback. Who wants to start <laughs> us off? You're always flashing your hardbacks around, aren't you? I, I am. I think if I look deep inside, this is, oh, look, it's, it's signed and everything. Um, oh, how do you feel about getting a hardback signed? It, it depends on the hardback. I'm not going to lie. Some of them I'm like, if it's a Galaxy 4, scribble or you'll like on it because they're a bit more commonplace. If it were my mint... First edition Genesis of the Daleks. I won't, I won't let anyone touch it, let alone sign it. I know. <laughs> I've, I've, I've tried to get my hands on that several times, and you've not let me. No, it, it, it's in a flux chamber that's been taken over by the the, the deviation or whatever they're called. <laughs> um, anyway, back to Doctor Who and the Dominators. So who's gonna Who's gonna kick us off on this? Look with its eighties logo. Who's gonna kick us off? Oh, I'll kick us off then. I'll kick us off. A visit to the planet Dulcus isn't quite the holiday that the Doctor was expecting. Um, the Dominators have arrived. They've got some very atomic ambitions. But the stars of the show here, James's favourites, the Quarks. We finally get to the Quarks. Uh, what can I say about the Dominators? Um, I'll start by saying I think this is, a, this is the modern day cure for insomnia, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think this story is as dull as dishwater. Um, <clears throat> it's clearly a, a troubled production. Um, uh, and we know it's on record that uh, uh, Mervyn uh, Hazeman and Henry Lincoln weren't happy with the scripts in the end, the rewrites and the constant changing. Obviously, then Derek Sherwin has to take it on. It then becomes a five part, not a six part. Um, there are some notable great appearances by um, a couple of great actors playing the Dominators. Um, talk about them a little bit later, but genuinely this story, I have actually fallen asleep a couple of times trying to watch this, um, but it genuinely is. Um, it's a slow one and it's not one of my favorites, I've got to be honest. Can you imagine if it had actually been six parts? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. It would. I can't. There's nothing I could think about that would be that bad. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'll address the quarks first because I do like the quarks, and, and and I know we joked about it on many a recording, um, but I, I quite like the design of them. They're they're, they're not necessarily menacing, um, but uh, but I do quite like them, and they they reappeared in comics if they didn't reappear in the actual show which is hotly uh, debated on other on, on other recordings but uh, I agree that actually the the story itself it does kick its heels somewhat um, and yeah there's this there's quite a lot of I mean to begin with it's quite you know it's quite uh, it, it's okay so you've got you know the scene where um the quarks destroy um the the boat the, the craft that they've got to the island on there's a bit of a mystery around the radioactivity of the island and they they kill off the uh Dul dulcians is it kill them off so it you know to begin with it's quite you know it comes across as quite brutal it's like oh we're going to kill everybody that that we bump into and then it really trods its way. Oh no, I'm not uh, convinced. I'm not convinced that the even, it's even exciting up till that point, James. To be honest with you, it, it's it. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of an odd start. I mean, it's all over the shop. The first few scenes. I mean, you were ten minutes before we even see the Doctor. Yeah. 
Um, well, I mean, there's a couple of points there. I think the, the cartoon thing with the the quarks is what the what, that was the straw that broke the the camel's back, wasn't it? Because they, they Hazem and Lincoln were upset that they'd lost an episode off it, and then the BBC licensed the comic strip without permission, and mm. chaos ensued, and the third Yeti story didn't happen. Um, I think also Pat, I think was was sort of uh, erring on wanting to do less he felt they were being overworked and so so if you notice the episodes get shorter during this run and doctor who and his plucky assistants seem to be arriving later and and you know apart from the next story where which is which is the again the straw that broke because like we've got one episode to carry the whole thing are you joking um it's interesting because the, the quarks like we said they 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 aren't terrifying and the funny thing is actually because if you if you watch and i was watching uh, the other day when i was watching this back the introduction where you have the two dominate do, dom, dominators dominators come out and they they call to the quarks but then the camera cuts away so you don't see them and there's lots of moments where they say quarks and it's like you don't see them it's like oh god this is going to be something actually this is this is nasty this is, they, you, they can't even show these bad boys and then at the end, these little boxes, and they're doing little arms, and they're, they're, they're like little petulant kids, aren't they? They're sort of little, 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 little brats in the playground, and it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's kind of like the destroy, shall we destroy? It's like mm, okay. I mean, yeah. seriously, somebody thought these were the replacement for the Daleks. I mean, crikey, they, they was, there's something not quite right in the brief here that was given to um, Hazeman and Lincoln here somewhere along the line. But, but the same sort of thing, I, I do like the design. It's, it, I love that 60s iconicity of it. I like the little the heads. They, they, they're a nice design. But I, it's a bit like we sort of discussed not so long ago about the Chumblies. There is that sort of thing of it's a lovely design, but it's 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 not a Dalek it's, it, it's mm. not it's just not frightening and they do have a little trundling motion which I mean, I mean to be fair in the 60s I've got to say that the series had an ambition whenever they had a monster of the week or whatever that might have been they had an ambition to try and make it try and make it um as as good as they could do and to be fair there are some great examples you know there are some really bad examples um uh, the Iridians for example I wouldn't quote back to the chase but I don't think that I, I like the design on the quarks um I, I think that the voice is wrong and you know uh, interestingly uh, voiced by um uh, 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 actress Sheila Grant um which make, makes me chuckle because I was thinking of the thing of Brookside but I think if they not voiced it in kind of the way that they did um and if they didn't if they'd given them some sort of quite heavy armament or or made them a little bit more threatening potentially the quarks could have had a could have had a more more of a menace on screen, but I think the fact that they seem to just, as you say, trundle along. They've got they've got sort of quite they've got quite a light voice, and then nothing particularly threatening about them. Um, I think lets them lets them down in my in my opinion. And yet that opening um, bit uh, where the the three um, come on the island with with Kali. And and the effect that, that that it sort of burns her uh, Talata, it burns her face up when it when it kills her. That's quite graphic. I think I think that's quite horrific to start with, and that's sort of sort of forgotten to an extent as it goes on. They don't they don't they don't bother with that effect again. It's like it's, it's the one off and and off. I mean they they almost they almost seem to become um, you know almost. Um... They're almost just out there chasing people around the planet. That's all they seem to do. And then they seem to run out of energy fairly quickly, you know, because they've been too busy running around rather than doing the drilling and doing the things. And, you know, you're right, that effect's only used once. And, you know, there is a genuine menace there in episode one, but by episode five, they're almost comical. But the construct at the heart of it, I quite like the idea. I think I, think I like that dynamic that uh, you've got a race who are sort of living for war, and oppression and domination and a, a race that are so far back the other way that they're, they're sort of almost idle, aren't they? They, they don't believe in, in conflict, they don't believe in fight because they're all just getting, they're all just treating people with kindness. Um, hey! Uh, but it's a nice dynamic. The problem being, I suppose, is that after a point, uh, that you you lose the sort of sympathy for the Dolcians to an extent because they are 
very wet. Oh yeah. God, aren't they just? They, they sort of the de- the debate. The, we cannot fight. We will not fight. And it's kind of like, no, oh, God. Did, did you make an appointment before you came in here, Dominator? You know, <laughs> it's kind of like what? I mean, it's like. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it echoes a lot of the themes that were around at that at that age at that time back in the late eight, back back in the late sixties. You know, obviously the peace movement was was big, and you know, obviously there is there is some there is some connotations you can take from the aggressors and the the pacifists in this. But you know, even you know, even when you watch the scenes with with the Dulcans in it, um, you know, when they when they're discussing something in their council room, it's like five minutes of. I mean, that is literally, the, 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 there's nothing, there's no, there's no redeeming feature for the Dolkans here at all. You know, the I mean, Dolcians, the, domin- the Dolkans, you're always taking them Vulcans. Oh, sorry, absolutely. <laughs> um, but there's no, but there's no redeeming feature um, here for them, in my opinion. And, you know, when you look at the character of the Dominators, um, actually, I think they're quite well realized, the, the Dominators. And, you know, I think, as I said, you've got, you know, you've got two, two, I think, really good actors here playing the part out and they're doing they're taking it in different directions both of them are doing slightly different interpretations of it but you know yeah I, I think part of the part of the the narrative of this story where it falls flat is when you've got those scenes in the council chamber or you know you, you're into the sort of you know we can't possibly attack them because you know we'll just let them attack us that's fine you know it's just, it's just it's flat I mean the, the the plot itself. If if you'd if it was shorter, you know they arrive. They want to use the planet for fuel. You know that's that's all right. You know they're going to drill these holes in. They're going to detonate it. They're going to create this, uh, you know, massive volcano. The, this power that they're going to be able to to refuel their ship, and they land on a planet which is full of pacifists. And on paper, that should be. A, a reasonable story you know you've got the doctor in the usual role of i'm going to help the people of the planet because they're pacifists i'm going to teach them how to fight i'm going to get them to defend themselves but you're right it, it then just becomes wallpaper based because you just get too bogged down in that it's, it's almost like well we've got six episodes then five episodes to fill in what could have been a much tighter four episode story. But if you think back to the Daleks, it was done in a much better way. Yep, the Thals mm. are pacifists to a degree, yeah. you know, and the Doctor spurs them on. And then they are, they quite actually then take it into their own hands and attack the Dalek city. And, you know, that's a natural progression, but you just don't see that progression in this story. So it, this is why I think that the narrative falls flat. It loses something if you start to think of um, uh, Raga and Toba as, as a bickering middle-aged gay couple, because <laughs> they, they, oh. they kind of do, don't they? There's a bit of a kind of like, no, you will do this, and it's kind of, uh, if, you, if you transplant that into a, a, bit, a great 70s sitcom, The Dominators, you could put, like, you've been watching an older appearance, Ronald Allen, you know, <laughs> oh. you know I love Ronnie Allen. You can't say anything bad about him. I mean, I'm a massive Crossroads fan. And I mean, you know, I watched Ronnie Allen for donkey's years, but I think he's, I think he's actually really good in this one. And I think Kenneth Ives is, is, is also, they, they, they give good portrayals, but you're right. They are a little bit like a bickery middle-aged old gay couple, aren't they? Let's be honest. I, I like the look. I like the shoulders. I like the, 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 the I think, I think Dominic as a looks fine. Um, I, I think the, the thing that sort of adds Unfortunately, to, to a slightly uh, bland feel, uh, the awful curtain costumes for the <laughs> Dulcian. <laughs> they, they are not flattering. They are not, and, and when poor Wendy, they're like, we'll get you some Dulcian clothes. She should have run a mile. She should have <laughs> run. I mean, they're, she's on record as saying she really didn't like those, the, that costume at all. It, it's bad. It's a bad thing. Um, it's interesting because I suppose I was thinking about the context of this is that you'd have just come straight out of a sort of seven weeks of Evil of the Daleks, wouldn't you? So, um, and then in, <laughs> into this. Um, so, so you'd have had sort of Zoe introduced, then Zoe not introduced because you'd have been back to Victoria and then back to, to Zoe. So this is sort of her 
second first story in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, it, she, she, she does incredible, and she's on, uh, on record as how awful Morris was to her during production. But she's she's incredible. I think from 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 the get go, she's got a spark and a and an attack to this, and, and and the three of them are, are, are all great. I think I think uh, as much as you could find the Dominators boring or a bit drab, I would say the regulars consistently <laughs> lift everything yeah. above yeah. where it would be without them. And, and I would say, even though Morris Barry may have been difficult for her to work with. There is something visually about Morris's work. You know, you see it in Tomb of the Cybermen, and he's clearly a director that knows what he wants to get and tries to get it. And I think, to be fair, the direction of the story, um, albeit it's a really bad story, the direction's not not that bad. You know, the scenes particularly he makes good use of quarries um, in in the in the on the on the film work, and even in studio, it feels quite it feels quite rich even in studio with the with the sets around the back and and um you know they've made it they've made an effort here to try and to try and visually make it look good um even though it's not as i said too strong in the narrative i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm a big fan of morris's direction on this one i think given compared to tomb where it's properly Mm. on point it does feel sort of I don't know if it feels like more pedestrian. Oh, I, I don't know. There are nice bits. I like the bit where Jamie and uh, the Doctor see the spaceship. I think that's a well-realised shot. I think maybe the location stuff's better than the studio is. But then what can you do with people sat in a debating chamber? <laughs> you know, I don't know. It, 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 it's difficult. But I do think there's a lot to like. I don't think it's as awkward. Because it's always traditionally, whenever you get sort of Doctor Who charts, Dr. Charts is that the right thing? Like polls are the best ever. You you will always have dominators and space pirates and the twin dilemma and time monsters, time and the Rani. You always have them all sort of lurking somewhere near the bottom. Said before, those space pirates might not be down that far if we would had a visual for it. It might be something a little bit better than that. But I don't I don't think dominators is is is, is that. I don't think it's bottom. Of the, I, I certainly don't think it's bottom of the pile. I mean, it, it's you know, it, it's got some deficiencies in there, um, but it's still a good example of of sixties who, um, you know, with monster of the week and and the, the regulars on good form. Um, it's just a shame the script lacks a little bit. I think because of the difficulties that they had. It's, I think it's not a very strong season opener. No, and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd agree with what you said earlier. So far as it, it's they cut the six down to five, but it, probably needs to be a four because you, you you do get to a point and I like I think the first episode is, is the strongest because it sets up the the mystery you know where's the radiation gone and you know they, they didn't encounter the domination until the very end and all that stuff. but thereafter you get a lot of destroy them no don't destroy them and destroy them no don't you get a lot of this kind of looping we must fight no we cannot fight we must fight and, and it, it Feels. I mean, I know obviously Doctor Who is made to be watched weekly, and I, before anyone says underneath, mm. don't watch the Dominators in one run. I, I appreciate that. I, I think it just gets into a little rut quite quickly between that the strong opening, and I think it doesn't really pick up again till Jamie and um, Cully go out throwing bombs at the Quarks. I think that's when it sort of lifts up again because it feels like something's actually happening. Agree, agree with that because it, oh, okay, you're right. We should be watching it as a weekly piece, not reviewing it and, and considering it. There wouldn't be very much in episodes two, three, and four that are there to entice me to come back for the following week. Um, yeah, you're right. Episode one's the strongest of the of the five. Um, there's some good interplay actually between between Cully and Jamie in this. They do team up quite well and 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 keep keep some sort of action going on alongside it. But no, I mean, even watching this weekly, you, you're going to think, oh. Go out, it's just, you know, go out to play or, or watch Dominators. Oh, I don't know quite know what I want to do because Dominators ain't that exciting this week. I don't know. Did you go out and play? No, he was at university, you mad fool. I wasn't <laughs> even born at this point. What are you all about? You're mad, people. You're mad. <laughs> He's watched it twice since on different speeds. We're all right. <laughs> I can assure you I've struggled to watch this at all. <laughs> I, I, Let alone what the, speed. I think guest cast wise, I also I love I I adore Felicity's voice. I love that sort of there's a 
I do this posh, airy. Quite, I, I love. I could listen to her talking for ages. I, I love her. I love her voice. Um, Miss Sun Silk, nineteen sixty nine, if you please. Mm, yeah, no, yeah. I'm surprised Stato's not got that up his sleeve for us. He's probably not been to our house for lunch. I don't know. No, that's that's personal friend over here. Look. <laughs> um. So yeah, I think I think Felicity and Giles. I think I think it's nice, and there's, there's probably not enough made of them. And I, they, they characters do have a nice little journey because they they do start to question and they do start to realise that perhaps you know what they're being taught isn't isn't the whole story. And I think that's quite nice as a little progression for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nice bits where where obviously um, Pat gets to do his comedy stuff. Um, he has to he gets to pretend to be stupid. I think that's all quite fun. He's like, so he tells Jamie, doesn't he? Pretend stupid. Oh yeah. no, just act normal. Kind of. He's like, I, I like, all, you know, it's fun. And they, I mean, they hold hands to to jump off the off the off the you know, bit of set so they don't get electrocuted and all. And, and there's lots of lovely, sweet little bits. Oh, but by this point, they're so in tune with one another, and you know that that just carries on throughout. That's going to be a theme of what we talk about through this season: is that 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 sort of interplay between both of those two is strong. Um, I don't know about you, but I almost feel Arthur Cox was a little miscast as Cully. I don't think he's quite he's quite right in the casting on it. Why? I I, I almost feel Cully should have been a younger person. Um, uh, you know, somebody almost almost to, to sort of be alongside Jamie Moore in that thing. I, I just I just mm. don't know. He just feels he feels at odds slightly in the story for me. Well, what I'll say then is they should have had um because because I'm I'm desperately shallow. I decided whilst watching it that Philip Boss you know my Doctor Who candy list, and he's killed within about two bloody minutes of this. <laughs> so Philip Boss should have been Cully. It's too late. It's too late to fix this now. But that that might have helped. <laughs> I'll get through all my episodes. Um, just a little shallow moment there for you, Divya. Oh, we're allowed. Um, we're allowed. <laughs> I suspect, and I'll, and 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 I'll and I'll I'll have a look on a device whilst 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 we talk. But I suspect actually Arthur Fox probably wasn't all that old when he did. Arthur mm. Fox was thirty four when he did this. He actually wasn't old. Wow. It's just that that thing of television in the sixties just made everybody look. 30 years older, <laughs> unless you're Wendy Pabry, in which you always look 16. Oh, she did. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, he, wasn't, he actually wasn't old there. His playing age oh. might have been less than that. I'm not being ageist, but I just, I just don't know. I just, I think for all the for all the guest roles, I think his jar's the, probably the most in this one for me. I don't, I don't, he's turned in a great, he turns in a great performance, but it just he just doesn't feel quite right in that role. And I agree with you. I think Philip Voss would have been um, probably better suited there. I, I think Cully, you slightly want to believe that he's um, a dynamic rogue because because he, he he's rebelling against his his father's position and he, he wants excitement and adventure and he sort of just looks like a tubby guy in a dress, which is fine, but I don't know whether it quite quite goes with the character yeah. as imagined. That's another flaw in those costumes as well, by the way. It's another floor of those. Oh, I think, you know, I, I, I say that I quite like a little curtain thing. I could, I maybe I could cosplay as a Dolcian. Oh, I can draw... think of the next Chiswick you will be there, the next Chiswick event dressed up as a Dolcian. That's right, you throw someone to sort of have a drawstring where you just pull it and then they just open at the front. <laughs> but they come from machines, don't they? They've got little vending yeah. machines for those, he says, doesn't they? I don't think there are any hairy Dolcians though, so I'd have to wax. Anyway, diversions. Um, <laughs> It's interesting in some ways as well, because these stories have always existed, haven't they, season six, as I sort of going forward. So having looked at season five quite recently, where there's so much of it missing, we've always sort of had season six. Um, does, does the Dominators give an indication that it, it's the wrong season that's junked? Or do you, think, do you think we would be hankering after the Dominators as a great thing if we couldn't see the visual? If, if we just had like a photo of the Dominators like behind me at the moment, I think we would probably be wanting it back. But I, I the story itself, when you watch it, you probably go, mm, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, and I've not listened. To, I've not listened to this like on an audio. I've only ever watched it, and I would imagine that the audio might drag as well because. 
you've got these long bits where they're just debating stuff and talking. Um, so yeah, but I, I think if you were to see the quarks, if you were to see the domin uh, dominators, you'd probably say, oh, that looks really good. Whether you'd feel the same when you get all five episodes. Because uh, yeah. in in interestingly, um, uh, one of the things we, we've done at Phantom is uh, the, the Lethbridge Stewart books, uh, which are audio versions of them. Um, and one of those, <laughs> I directed it. Um, was it's mutually assured destruction, which is it's the dominators and the quarks, and I can remember sort of looking at it and I thought, oh, you can't get a story out of the dominators and the quarks. It's like, you know, they did that one. It's, like, it's really good. It is really good. So there's part of me thinks that actually there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the dominators and the quarks because I mean the story. Yeah. As I said this story is is a really good one. The dominators on screen less so. So I, I slightly wonder whether. In the right context, it would it, I mean, let's be honest, the flux, imagine if it hadn't been the Sontarans, it'd been the Dominators and the Quarks that had come <laughs> over the it hillside. Should it should have been the Dominators and the Quarks. Uh, still hold out hope maybe in the last episode we'll just see some, some, some of this. <laughs> destroy them? No, don't no. destroy them. Oh, God. We're not going to get this in 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I do slightly feel sad that the, there isn't a, maybe a return for them in some ways because yeah. the concept's nice and, I, the, and, and the war thing's nice. I, 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 it works. I, I agree. I think, you know, um, I, I think the issues clearly in the writing of this w wasn't necessarily down to, um, to, to the writers. It was more down to, the, I think, the speed they were trying to get this thing together and, you know, obviously there's always bigger deadlines in TV. And, you know, we've come to terms, we love the Yeti, the Yeti are a great concept, you know, the great intelligence is a great concept. So these guys have got great, have got, got some great imagination. And actually you're right, I don't think the Dominators and the Quarks um, are a poor combination here in any way, just not served by the fact that I just think the story's just not underpinning it here. But you get Dalek stories where the story's not underpinning it. You get Cybermen stories where the story's not underpinning it. So, you know, this isn't an unusual thing. Um, I think we could, we could and should have seen a return of the Dominators and the Quarks in the series. And if it weren't for the falling out um, between the BBC and the writers following this, um, I think we have been a little bit robbed of not having further adventures um, with these particular creations? Because, um, I mean, The Abominable Snowman and The Weather are both great stories, so it does it does seem a bit odd that having got the, the, the gist of it on, on those two. I know they didn't particularly get on well with Derek, and so maybe there's a little issue in terms of you know, that situation. But the, you don't get sent this and think, oh, they, they, they were brutalised. There should have been another week of, of, of this. and And... So it's odd to get a writer or well, writers in the situation who got it so well previously to misfire so badly afterwards. That said, I, I still don't think it's as awful as, as people might suggest. I think there's a lot of lovely elements to pull out. I, I said, we talked about the interplay. Uh, another scene that I really loved was on the Dominator ship where Zoe's reeling off a load of gabble about how great the, the, the power capacity and then and, and Patrick goes, it must be pretty pretty powerful as well. And I, it, <laughs> I, I like all that they've got that so quickly and they've got that relationship. And and Zoe obviously as a character has the, this beautiful sort of arc actually throughout the season, which she goes from being just I do logic and figures, I do logic and figures to, to being a character and, and and you see that actually as it progresses that she becomes a bit more personable. She isn't just the robot person. I mean, in Wing Space, she is literally the brainchild. She's just facts. And yeah. already you can see that they've, they've got that element, but they're, they're you know, giving her a character with it too. Mm. Yeah, they agree. No, no I, do, I do agree, absolutely. Yeah, I, was, I was nodding away. You can't see it, but yeah, absolutely. It is I'm very insightful. So do you think yeah. we are heading towards... 
a score um, on Doctor Who in the Dark. Oh no, we've got facts. Oh, we've got facts. Oh, oh, no, oh, you're no, yeah, no, listen, no, 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 listen. Oh no, 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 are these going to be no, real facts? facts? These are quark stats. No, I think he's going to be telling us in a minute Thunderbirds were due to be in this or something. I'm thought there's going to be something along these no. lines here. I can't the dark wait. web has been ravaged for these. Uh, no, I was going to say, you mentioned about Troughton earlier on and about how he didn't want to, you know, the, the filming schedule. So there was uh, Chris Jeffries stood in for Troughton, uh, I think in almost all of the location shots uh, where you couldn't see Troughton's face. So there, there, there was a period of time where he was not on the set. Um, they had a, a double and the Quarks were played by children from a nearby school. So they were in the in the uh, robots so that was it that was that was about as exciting facts as i could find about this episode well, i feel like there's an anti-climax had there to be honest i was expecting some massive revelation there that they were they were oh they the were... quarks were supposed to be in the five doctors but i don't think i've ever mentioned that yo i don't think you have either to be honest with you <laughs> fake uh, news <laughs> fake <laughs> <laughs> One of our very bad running gags, viewer. That's all I'm saying. Right. Jason Clifford, what points are you going to award to Doctor Who and the Dulcian Dilemma? Okay. So, um, I'm going to, I can't dress this one up, I don't think, particularly. So, it's not the best start to the, the, the season. We've got 44 weeks of Doctor Who here, and the first five weeks are taken up with this particular story. Um, the Monster of the Week, great, love the Quarks, love the Dominators. Um, it's just the story. It falls so flat. It's as dull as ditch water. And quite honestly, um, yeah. I can't stay awake when I'm watching it. So I'm kind of like, it's not one of my favorites. Um, the regulars do their best to lift it. And I'm, I'm in the camp that I think Morris Barry lifts it slightly, um, but it's a little bit of a struggle. And therefore um, the Dominators gets a three from me. Wow. She's harsh tonight. Yeah, because there's some, there's some good stories coming up in this season and this ain't one of them, honey. <laughs> That's not even a point per episode. You've, you've ruined your own formula. No, I've just rewritten the script a little bit more and, and condensed it down further to a three-parter. <laughs> Total destruction. James, what score are you on the door for Doctor Who? Well, I feel slightly better about my score now. Uh because uh, yes it does have the quarks and yes i do like them and the dominators but the rest of the the story is a bit more paper paced it really is uh so i scored it it is uh season six and it is five episodes so i scored it five gosh wow it's very generous it's like james that's very generous it's a good start. I, I, you know, I think I think Jason's gone incredibly harsh on that one. Actually, I think the sleep's just a attention span thing, maybe. Um, <laughs> kindness, kindness. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I, I would, I would be hard pressed to say anything with the, the three regulars, and it would be less than a five for me. So. Mm -hmm. I I think it's fun. I don't think it's I don't think it's the best thing in the world, and it has got a lot of faults with it, and the the parts that I think do need changing. But I like the dominators. I like the regulars. I like some of the guest cast. I gave Doctor Who and the dominators six. Oh, okay. Yeah, more than either of you two. Well, twice as much that's, as I gave it. That's because I'm a kindly spirit. You are. So that gives Doctor Who and the dominators. 14. Ooh, okay. I don't think that's going to be... I, I was going to say, I'm struggling to see it winning the season, but, you know, I'm going to live with it for now. You never know what might might fall the next story. And our next story is The Mind Robber. So Jason had a scripted intro to The Dominators, which was quite similar to the back of the W.H. <laughs> Allen book. <laughs> Mysterious. <laughs> So, so I guess this must be my turn now. Is it in our in our revolt? 
thing turns. Well, James, uh, if it, can I just say, if it starts off, to escape a catastrophic volcanic <laughs> eruption, the doctor, <laughs> I'll know where you've got it from. No, my liner is completely different to that. So we are off to the land of fiction, not to be confused with the Bucks Fizz classic, the land of make-believe. So uh, yes, we, we left our adventurers in the TARDIS <laughs> being drowned in lava and uh, they have sort of got themselves out of one scrape and into another. Uh, but before that, I have to say one of my sort of, uh, you know, we talk about some of the classic moments in, in Doctor Who. It is actually the cliffhanger to part one when the when the TARDIS explodes and you've got Zoe <laughs> clinging on to the, the TARDIS console. So you have them do this emergency uh, sort of shift into to another, I don't know, is it another dimension? Is there another sort of outside of time and space or nothingness nothing nothingness yeah they might have bumped into the division there you never know um but anyway so <laughs> and then they um end up in the the land of fiction and um uh, when you're watching this again I, i've not watched this for ages uh and when you're watching it you hear lots of references to the master and you think oh have i missed have i missed a story where the master is in before the Pertwee eras, but it turns out to be uh, the master and the master brain. Um, but uh, yeah, and lots of literary uh, characters for, and uh, myth and mythology as well. So some of which can be seen on the front cover of the hardback edition of Doctor <laughs> Who and the Mind Robber. Is this it's one of those common good. ones? Is this a common one or is this a rare I, one? I think it's fair to middle. I don't think it's the most common but I don't think it's the rarest. So that's as committal as a, a response as you could possibly want. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, look. Um, Hardback hard heaven we've got going on there. We have. I, th I think th that, that scene at the end of part one, I, th I think the exploding tiles is great, but, but, but Padbury knows what she's doing there. That is something definitely for the dads. And I think <laughs> um, it's, it's a scene that's oft remembered, isn't it? The, the, Zoe's bum on the console. That's what. That's that's the only thing we can say, isn't it? Really, it is. Um, actually, it's a slight miracle. The first episode, isn't it? Because it because it is born out of out of necessity of yes. having nothing. Just going. We've got these robot costumes from the cupboard. We've got the regulars. We've got it. We've got to make twenty minutes of action, and and it just means that you can experiment and be even more surreal. I think it's probably as surreal as the show ever went before or after. I don't think there's, I mean, I'm struggling to think, I don't think there's a story, maybe the ultimate foe bits in the Matrix, sort of maybe some of the deadly assassins in the Matrix, maybe. Kingdom. But as a whole story, I don't think there's anything quite as unusual as the mind robber. Mm. No, I'd, I'd agree. I think, um, uh, I think it's very atmospheric. It starts the story off and actually doesn't feel as if it's jarring against what we ultimately end up with, which was the original, you know, the four part around the land of fiction that that was there. That was a script that obviously bolted this on, but it adds an atmosphere and eeriness to the story. And you almost feel like we, we're seeing the doctor in, in some kind of something he's not been in before. He, and Trout's almost playing playing into this this episode as well. He's doing something a little bit different with the character. So you've you know it's always difficult. You've got stories set within the boundaries of the TARDIS. They can get a little bit boring. Um, Edge of Destruction isn't, but you know this is a good example of where um, out of out of nothing comes actually a very strong episode. Um, it fits well, comes in well to the other story. I just love the little touches in this one. You know, they're taken out of time into nothingness. You know, you step outside the TARDIS and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're in white costumes. Everything's white. The TARDIS is white. It just feels really eerie. And then you've got that totally unexplained and quite bonkers, frankly, um, explosion of the TARDIS scene at the end. Um, it, although it feels like it falls apart because it's just mm. the prop. But... Um, it takes you into the story and you when you land into the second episode it genuinely felt like that first part was always part of this story and and it, it sets the tone for something that's going to be actually a little bit off the wall 
for the rest of it. So, you know, we're into um, almost a whimsical story here. You know, we've got almost like a 1940s children adventure that's going to play out once we're into the land of fiction. And, you know, I remember watching this years ago when um, I saw this years ago on, uh, on the big screen at the BFI. And it was my first time I'd, I'd seen um, the um, Mind Robber. And I didn't know what to expect. I loved it then and I love it now. I think it's a great story. Um, and, you know, it, it, it plays to your imagination. It plays, the storytelling of it plays to your imagination. So there's a lot going on. Um, some people don't get the fantasy element in Doctor Who at times, but I think in this instance, it sits perfectly well for me. One of the sad parts about the restoration, usually I, I, I love all the, the vid firing and the cleaning and all that stuff. One of the sad parts about the restoration on the Mind Dropper is that it slightly takes away that fuzz on the first episode where it's just white. Mm -hmm. The restoration means you can now see the edge of the studio and the floor, and stuff, which on the VHS and, and I, I, on original transmission, you wouldn't have seen. It would have just been sort of ethereal white, whereas because it's all been clean. And it's lovely, and I appreciate the work that goes into cleaning them, but it does highlight that it's, it's, it's sort of a backdrop to that. It's such a shame because it's something that wasn't there before. It wasn't visible. Indeed. But I love the fact that they take an empty studio and essentially that's your set. And, and that's a brave move for any production. You know, obviously there was no budget for sets, so they had the TARDIS sets, although we were introduced to the power room, which we don't ever see again. Um, but that that starkness of that set, um, you know, even though you can see the psych at the back, the starkness of that set's brave because you've just got three actors or two actors and a couple of robots in a very large studio that was probably the Blue Peter set. I uh, always imagined that it was the Blue Peter set. They just wheeled the trolley set that used to have the ornaments on it and they took the Blue Peter badge out of the background and they just wheeled themselves in there for the day and, and shot it. But yeah, I like it. I think it's starkness of that background that actually adds to the atmosphere in, in this particular story. Even more chilling when they run back into the TARDIS, the scanner says producer Peter Bryant. <gasps> you is couldn't that see part that of before the... it was cleaned up. <laughs> is, is that part of the fiction, is it? Is that, are they now part of the episode that they're in? Because oh, yeah, the, the, there is the fan theory... Now you can debate this forever on Gallifrey Base if you want to. But once they went into the land of fiction, they never came out. Isn't that the flux? Yeah. But there are there are so many clever things around this. I mean, later on, the doctor has to stop himself becoming a fictional character, otherwise, he will be stuck in the land of fiction. There's this whole I and, and I find this like whenever I watch this, I, I'm just like is that how 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 does this work because the, the point where they are narrating the story as it's happening so jamie for example the you know one of the ways out of the cliffhanger is he sort of says the doctor finds a sword and then the doctor picks up the sword um you've got um the oh the superhero that um that the Zoe carcass the carcass oh. Which has got a ridiculous name, you know, <laughs> superhero, the carcass, lovely. Um, and, it, and again, you know, they they use that. Uh, Zoe defeats the carcass and then, you know, he becomes her slave. But then there's a point where the doctor doesn't know this story. So he can't say he doesn't believe it because he, he, he's, he's got no knowledge of it being an actual story. So there, there were some fascinating concepts around... You know, the, 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 the level of peril is very easy to step into uh, becoming a literal uh, character because of, you know, this narration that's going on behind the scenes. Uh, I love the fact they had to write uh, Fraser Hines out because he got chicken pox uh, for two episodes. So they, they, they turned him into, a, you know, he got shot. He got turned into this cardboard cutout. The doctor had to rearrange his face. And because they had this standing actor, it, they were able to just like explain it away by saying the doctor didn't get his face right. 
But in no I, other story could you get away with that, though. And exactly. I think that's where you've you've almost suspended. You've you've, you've gone into this. It is a real fantasy thing that's going on. Yeah. Here. You would not get away with that. And I love the fact that you know instead of just writing the character of Jamie out or locking him up in a dungeon for two weeks, they thought, yeah, let's bring let's bring him, let's bring somebody else in to play him, and it really sits well with this story. I like on the documentary on the DVD that Wendy says the the big regret is that they didn't didn't like Hamish enough to keep him on and get rid of Fraser afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. I much like when when she says her favourite bit, slapping him in episode one. It's a joke. <laughs> but already, I mean, again, already you can the interplays we sort of said about you know the different characters. It, it's there and I think actually Hamish do, does does a good turn as Jamie oh, yeah yeah he's believe it's believable um you know because of the the whole the, the whole sort of the whole zaniness around this particular story he's actually he actually steps in and it's it, you know imagine that you're asked to step in at really short notice to take on you know what is one of the lead roles in an ongoing an ongoing children's tv program and you've got to try and hit the ground running and be that character and right from the get go, you know, you, you you can actually believe that the doctor genuinely has just put the wrong face on this guy. The the mannerisms are there, um, and I think the the regulars around him, both Pat and Wendy, they they really they really are they've got their arms around him. They really are trying to make this this whole sort of situation work. And I think that shows the bond between between them all there. I think. But you have that whole scene where where he's like asking him questions. He's like, if you're really Jamie, then you know, tell me this, and and, and you, you're kind of like watching the, the doctor go through what happens when he regenerates, and the companion is like, well, who are you? You know, you don't have the same face. It's, it's quite, I found that really quite funny that the doctor's like, hang on a second, you know, I put your face back wrong. <laughs> you know, are you still Jamie? And he's, he's asking all these questions, and you get the reaction again from, uh, from Zoe later on when she says, who's this? Um, but it, I just... Again, like you say, this is probably the only story you could ever get away with that. And, and considering how in, in quite a lot of these stories and in the Hartnell ones as well, actors would take a holiday for a week or two weeks and they wouldn't be in a whole episode. I think it was very brave to say, OK, well, he's off. Let's just replace him. You know, we'll carry on filming. We'll just replace him with a different actor. We've got a great idea for how this could how this could happen i think it's, i think that is just genius in this story i really do lots of other good performances within it i like bernard horsefall it's a david yeah. maloney so you get you can get bernard horsefall in um and he does a, a great great turn in this um because it, it, it's easy i think to if you're playing uh fictional characters like that because because it's, it's meant to be a fictional character within the, the scheme of it that you could easily send it up. And I think I think there's a, a nice reality to the different characters as they come in. There is a, real, there is a reality there for sure. And um, also the way that this script, again, the, again, the bonkersness of some of this scripting is brilliant. The, the lines that Bernard's delivering are all lines out yeah. of Gulliver's Travels. They, 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 nothing, that's it. They, they, there's they, nothing they, scripted. It's all no. original text. Yes. Yeah. But the script is written around it, yeah. so you're wrapping lit. You're wrapping that sort of literary, literary, literary sort of. You you you're taking um, you're taking the two things and melding them together, and and you're coming out with something that works. And you don't get it the first couple of times you watch it. You only get it the more the more into it you get, the more you watch it, the more you see it. Um, and again, it's not shoehorned in there, so you know. Um, yeah, it's it's really well played, and you know Christopher mm -hmm. Robbie is carcass. We've talked about carcass, but you know it's an over the top um, characterization that's played to be over the top for me, and it is perfectly positioned in this story. I mean, there, there was copyright issues because uh, Peter Irving wanted um, Zorro to appear, but there was copyright issues over that. So they were, I think, that was originally going to be one of the characters that they they came across but all of the you know all they sort of dip it and you see later on where jamie's in the room with all the different 
videos, you know, the, the video screens that have got all the different texts that they're taking characters from. Um, again, I think that's just so clever uh, in, in that respect, you know, that you, you've got like Rapunzel and then like you say, you've got Gulliver and, and they don't reveal it to be Gulliver until much later on. So you, you've got no idea at that point. It's just a, you know, it could be anyone from any time, um, you know, and, and just, I don't know. I, I just think it's really well thought out. The way that the way that they introduce these characters and and the way that the master manipulates them as well so he he writes that jamie and zoe uh find out that the doctor is the most evil person you know and then they they trap him in a fake tardis and, and you know the master brain is is trying to basically recruit the you know the master's trying to recruit the doctor to replace him um and it, it just it's really well done Emrys James is a, is a, is a great uh, yeah. performance. It's someone I've not actually spoken about. I don't, you quite often, you know, Dr. Evans applaud different performances a lot. Someone not actually spoken about, and, and it, is, it is a very well-measured performance, and he does, he does the different uh, facets of it. He does, he does, he does the, 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 the sort of villain part, and he does the bumbling, and it's, it's a really nicely measured performance. Um, so it's someone that needs a, needs a shout out and a bit of credit, I think, for that. Yeah, he doesn't go over the top with it at all. I think you're right, he's measured. It's very subtle. It's a very subtle portrayal and it and it works really well. You know, I mean, for years we've had this debate, you know, raging amongst fandom. Is it really the master? Is it the first time we've really seen the master? You know, is it a forerunner to it? Is it something that triggered the, the sort of thing back, you know, further on down the line? You know, I don't, I do not subscribe to the fact that this is anything other than just a character that's attached into a brain the master brain i don't get it it's it's i, I don't buy the concept of it um and i think you'd be taking away from the storytelling and the and the characterization here if you were to think anything differently mm. i mean i remember reading um the, there's a new adventure called conundrum yeah. Lyons. I, I read that i remember enjoying that at the time i don't really remember much else about it it's, it's got Ace on the cover with a gun and all that. Stuff. So, I'm saying I enjoyed that when I read that. So maybe that's worth checking out, folks. If you like, it did enjoy Mind Robber because I remember it being a, a good sequel to this. You've got to shout out Peter Ling here as well um, for the script because I think that's that's, a lot of this story is the script. Um, there's a, some fabulous performances, but your performances can only be as good as what's written under it. And actually, interestingly. You know, it's, it's all, it seems to be Crossroads references here, but Peter Ling, obviously <laughs> a, a, a prolific writer on Crossroads for many years. You had Ronnie Allen in the previous um, story. So, you know, you've got these sort of Crossroads Wendy connections Papri. playing all the way through here. Yeah. Wendy Papri was was Crossroads regular. She was Nolly's... Um, she was. Adoptive child, wasn't she? She was, yes. She had a, she had a stint on Crossroads in the 60s. Um, so, you know... It's down to the script here as well. So you've got to you've got to lay a little bit of this at P. And I think Peter Ling deserves credit for that. And also for writing novelization. Mm. He's waving his heart back around. Again. I just want to wave my heart back. I've got, I've, got the, I've got the audio read by Sir Derek Jacobi as well. I don't think you'll ever better. Um, a display of books than the one you did in our Galaxy 4 presentation when you had yeah, the when entire you had... world of Galaxy 4 in one hand. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, where, where's the mind of a vinyl? That's what I want to know. Where is it? <laughs> Coming it'll, soon. It'll well, come. It'll well, come. There's, there's money to be made on it. It'll, it'll happen. <laughs> um, I also think in this story, the, the white robots work really, really well in the, in the first episode. Um, and I almost feel they jar a little bit when they when they turn back up again a little bit further on down the line. And towards the end, they've got that sort of maniacal sort of they 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 get they're shooting everything in sight in episode five, um, and you can almost see the craziness there. But they don't work as well, I think, outside of the first episode. Is one paid, downer, I would say. They've paid to spray paint them, haven't they? Because in Out of the Unknown, they're black, aren't they? So they've spray painted them white, and they've uh, got to get the money back on the paint, haven't they? <laughs> Um, I like the the visual effects well with the, the Medusa. I think that's well done. The snakes, the the animation for that, because that can't have been cheap or easy to do. No, um, that and the Minotaur thing. But that's the that's the talent of David Maloney, though, isn't it? You know, 
you know, he, he crops up time and time again as being a stalwart director on, on Doctor Who. And, you know, he again, he's, you know, he's got a good script. He's got, he's got some good guest stars around him and he's visualized the story. You know, he must have looked at that story and thought, the hell am I going to do with this? Because, um, mm. you know, any director stepping up to a script that looks like Peter's script is going to go, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a bit of a challenge here. But I think he rises to it and you're right, that Medusa scene, um, the stuff on film looks almost as if it's in a feature film for me. It's the kind of Clash of the Titans esque, isn't it? You know that that scene in in there. Uh, I think it's worth a, a shout out because this is the last um, Doctor Who serial that had the telly snaps because um, John Cura died shortly after this story. So the the later stories like the Pirates um, don't have telly snaps because he passed away. So this was the last one that had the telly snaps, which is oh, quite sad. That is sad, actually, because I think telly snaps of the space pirates might actually have helped us understand it a little bit more. I think he, I think it's the, is it the, he 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 stops taking I think after episode two, or I think and then yeah. died not long after. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Are are we cruising towards a score on this, or are there more exciting facts to behold? Uh, the, uh, the original title for this, so there was a couple of original titles, but the, one of them was Manpower, which is just, I, I have no idea how that fits in with the story. <laughs> but apparently when they shot the first couple of episodes, that was the working title, was Manpower, which is very, which is very odd. Um, um, no, that was, that, was, that was pretty much it um, from what I had. I did apparently also peter ling wrote zoe because he, he wrote the story as victoria was uh, just left and they hadn't cast um wendy at that point so they, they were he was writing it with the idea of a generic female companion so he wrote the name zoe and obviously that's the name that they ended up uh going with for, for wendy but yeah that was it i mean yeah could probably talk for hours about all the different references to literature but i think it's a shame they didn't roll the quarks into this one as well wow i know i know john john greenwood who's in this um he's still got the sword when he came to bristol to do pandorica he, all, all those years after he still had the sword and he took it on the train with him which it was even more remarkable than <laughs> nobody questioned that um it's interesting because uh, uh, on, on a slightly indulgent point here is that this was shown in 92 as part of the repeat season. Um, and so actually, Mama Ballard made me watch episode five of this. Um, and it piqued my interest enough to go back the week after and watch Sea Devils. And thereafter, I was, you know, magazine buyer, video buyer. So actually, episode five of this has got a hell of a lot to answer for in terms of <laughs> what's, what's happened to my life ever since. So. It's a little, little point for you there. So I think Jace went first last time. So James, as you had your pre-scripted introduction, you can give us your score. I will do. Um, I don't think it's very often that we have sat here and gone, they've added an, an extra episode to a story and made it better. But I actually think that this story that that extra episode at the beginning doesn't detract from from anything else in the story and I, and I agree with what you were saying Jason it allows them to do just so many different concepts that you know if if you were to imagine this being made now you know the the, the I mean, just, you know, your head would probably explode at that point but I, I just think this is so cleverly done and for the time the effects are very good um, you know, the, the, the interplay between the doctor and, you know, the master or the master brain. Really, I love that idea of um, changing the story as you go along because you're narrating the story as you go along uh, and nothing's impossible in this world. Uh, and so for that reason, I did give this nine. Because I really like it. That's, that's three times what Jason gave the Dominators. Yes, it is three times what I gave the Dominators. You're quite correct. Um, 
do you know what, James, you've just taken a lot of what I was going to say, actually. And, and you know, I've, I've already said it and I've been quite... Um, Sorry, was that on the back of the uh, hardback book as well? No, that's fine. Don't worry. It's, I'm very positive about this story. I think David Maloney's direction is very strong here, but I actually think the, the, the true part of this is that they were prepared to go out on a limb and deliver something that was a bit quirky and a bit out there and probably suited Doctor Who at that time. Um, if you compare this to the previous story, the Dominators, the chalk and the cheese here for me, um, I think you've got that massive tension build up in episode one, that whilst that may have been a late entry to the field, actually makes this story um, something very, very different from the get go. So when you do hit the land of fiction and all the storytelling and all the bits that come with that, it's not as jarring as it would have been had we just landed into that. So I think it sets a, sets a real good strong scene here as you come into it. Um, you've got some great guest cast. You've got the regulars who are on song, albeit we, 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 we lose Jamie for a couple of them. I think the, the way they write that through is brilliant um, on a number of levels. You've got the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant performance by Emrys Jones. Um, Hey, this is a good story. And James, we're gonna we're gonna match up on our scores here because this deserves a very, very solid nine. I, I honestly for a second thought Jason would say, well, in my summation, ISBN 0 491 0368-5. <laughs> I, I remember not to do that next time. <laughs> As as if as as if that could happen. Um, I have to quickly shout out um, Evan Hercules is the designer on this because you said how great the design was on this. So I can first name check him because he had a heck of a lot to take off the page and visualize. Um, not least the, the the white horse when they gave him the brown horse and all that oh, sort yeah. stuff. Um, a unicorn, sorry, not a horse. It was obviously a yeah. unicorn. Um, but there's a there's an awful lot they had to contend with when he's got the same budget as an episode of Crossroads. Um, I really like it. Um, I'm, I'm slightly below you guys on this, on score front. Uh, and I gave the Mind Robber an eight. Oh, still very respectable. Still yeah. very respectable. Very respectable. Which finishes the Mind Robber on 26 points. Ooh, Is sure. it a winning score, though? Is it? I don't know. It probably, I don't know. We don't know yet. Um, chalk and cheese, though, for me, these two stories that have opened this season up. Um, so that means that at this early juncture on season six, uh, Mind Robber's in the lead with 26, and The Dominators is slightly behind on 14. But it is all still to play for. There are another five stories. And another 300 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more, maybe more. So we shall be back for part two of season six. I have better fingers by then. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. Pleasure thank as you. always. I'm going to steal it away from Jason eventually. There we go. Hey, that was a victory. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like, subscribe, join us again, and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.